Dark Tyrannus is no pushover. Django Fett takes out Mace Windu. You can use the Force to summon... <laughs> Am I the only one who actually watched the movie? <laughs> Fun, Fun times, times with, with Junko. 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 Concentrate fire on sector 11374265. 11374265. What was that again? Just fire right there. Well, it's official. Star Wars, The Clone Wars, The Movie, A Star Wars Story, entry number 1138 from the Journal of the Wills is now 10 years old. How has it been 10 years already? I have no clue. I am deathly afraid of the passage of time, and I want to die, but before I die, I want to talk some cartoons, specifically a Star Wars cartoon. I think with the new Star Wars The Clone Wars TV series revival being announced, it's the perfect time to go back and look just how all this started. Come with me, Junkos and Junkettes, as I take us to a hive of scum and villainy. A time known as May 2005. Aaron's aka Darth Vader here. Now, Chris, how long have you been in line today? Uh, since about six. I'm not as crazy as some of these people. Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith had just been released in both theaters and Little Golden Book, and the number one song at the time was Holla Back Girl by Gwen Stefani. Not to be confused by Hologram Girl, produced by Max Rebo. Now at the time I was about eight years old, with thoughts in my mind like, fuck, I can't wait for Obama, or... Boy, I hope they change the back of the Captain Crunch box so I can have more activities to do. They never did. They never did. France, Canada, Japan. With the release of Revenge of the Sith rounding out the saga, it was agreed upon by most that we probably weren't going to be getting any more Star Wars movies. At least, it seemed like that way for a while. Nobody at the time thought there was ever going to be an Episode 7, or a Rogue One, or a whole other game also called Battlefront 2 that is fundamentally worse than the original in almost every way. It just wasn't happening. Plus, G -G 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 Georgie himself said it was all over. No, there was to be no more theatrical films. Instead, Star Wars' next venture was to be in television with a Star Wars live-action TV show and a 3D Clone Wars series. And make no mistake, I got all this information from my older brother who frequented the then-new Wookiepedia, which introduced me to so many fascinating Star Wars characters like Will Rowe Hood, the guy in Bespin that runs with an ice cream machine, or did you know that the skull that Luke uses to push that button in the Rancor Pit belonged to a guy named Bidlo? While I was excited to be getting some new Star Wars stories in some form and my imagination was ripe with ideas of what was to come, I was very puzzled that there was going to be another Clone Wars show. They already made Clone Wars by the dude who made Samurai Jack, I thought. I didn't understand what stories from that era were left to tell. Was this going to be a retelling, a remake? Was it going to fill some supposed gaps in the story we knew? Star Wars Clone Wars, coming this November to Cartoon Network. All right, now fast forward to the year 2007. We still don't hear much about the show until this point. We get an image of Yoda's 3D model, but that's about it for a while. Around this time, I remember seeing this cover of a magazine with a teaser image for the show. The article talked about how Anakin was going to have a new apprentice in the series, and this mysterious character's face was obscured in shadow. If I was confused before, now I was just bewildered. How could Anakin possibly have an apprentice between episode two and three, and nobody happens to mention it at all? didn't make any sense to me. It was outrageous. It was unfair. In all honesty, it was just too big of a retcon for me to take in at the time. So summer 2008 rolls around and there I am at my local public library, the cool spot to hang out at the time, browsing this pretty cool new website called YouTube which had all these neat Star Wars related videos like Chad Vader, Jedi Kid, and a bunch of lightsaber fights between fans in their backyards. It was here I actually found out that Star Wars The Clone Wars would be getting a theatrical release as a movie with the show's premiere following up a few months later. Even though I had my reservations, I was pretty ecstatic that we'd be getting a new Star Wars movie on the big screen. The release of the movie eventually came, and I honestly think this is one of the earliest instances of me reacting cynically to something. I'd be entering the sixth grade. I had no time for the schlock for seven-year-olds. I had episodes I Carly to jerk off to. I mean, masturbate to. I mean, 
uh, enjoy with my penis. Boner. Even when watching the movie, I was still really averse to the character of Ahsoka Tano. It just seemed really clear to me that she was shoehorned in to cater to the kids, for what I thought at the time was at the expense of a sensible, more coherent story. I'm the new Padawan learner. I'm Ahsoka Tano. I also just wasn't a big fan of animation. Sure, yeah, at the time, CGI movies from studios like Pixar were putting out some impressive, ultra-detailed work, but this movie was clearly a springboard for the TV series during a time when 3D animated shows were still a novel concept. But let's just say they still had a long way to go. When the golden standards at the time were shows like Back at the Barnyard, it was pretty unclear how well an expansive, big-budget, action-driven space opera would transfer to CG. We came a long way from this. Just to get to shit like this. <laughs> so the Clone Wars could have easily been a major embarrassment. In retrospect, I think the CG in the movie looks rather decent, and I consider it to be pretty impressive now. The animation in the TV series, however, got marginally better over time. Like, a lot better. Better lighting, more detailed environments and characters, and overall, some of the best 3D animation that didn't come out of a Pixar or DreamWorks project. It probably has something to do with George Lucas himself launching that Skywalker money out of pocket into the show's budget, something he did with some of the original Star Wars films as well. Like, come on, if you didn't already know beforehand, how many of you would be able to tell whether or not this was from the TV show or the movie? So while the animation holds up pretty decently, what about the story? The plot goes as follows. Two space ninjas and a kid space ninja need to protect a slug baby from an evil wizard and a hairless, thick, mole rat while a war wages between an army of robots fighting a bunch of the same dude, and they eventually need to travel to a CGI rendering of a desert in Tunisia in order to reunite said slug baby with his father, Jabba Desahi Leek Tior Hussein the Hutt. This movie was panned by the critics upon its release, with a lot of them calling it cheap and emotionless, and a lot of the fans were just simply indifferent to its existence. Some critics called it out for what it was, a plug for the then-upcoming TV show. Coming up next, it's Star Wars The Clone Wars on Cartoon Network. Some of the critics also found the plot either too boring or confusing, asking questions like, how does this thing fuck? I don't know, maybe those two dudes inside Jabba get it on with shoelaces crumb. I need to know, Disney, please. While the reaction to this movie was overwhelmingly negative at the time, I can understand where a lot of these critics are coming from. Anybody familiar with Clone Wars knows that the series episodes were divided into arcs, and it's quite clear that this was just Lucasfilm stringing together three episodes and editing it into a movie. Aside from introducing some new characters, nothing monumentally important happens rather than establishing the framework for the series. And compared to the menagerie of amazing episodes that the Clone Wars show actually went on to have, the movie's plot isn't anything too special. You follow Anakin and Ahsoka as they need to protect this hut baby and deliver it back to Jabba. The two try to find their footing as Anakin learns to accept his role as a teacher, while Ahsoka has to learn to temper her arrogance. And we watch them grow to accept and learn to work off of one another, setting the stage for the rest of the series. It's not bad by any means, but nothing that would constitute a theatrical release. It was more about laying a foundation than anything. If you're just looking to dive into the TV show, go right ahead. You're not missing too much by skipping this one. And if you feel that you like this show enough, you can go back and watch it. They're all on Netflix for now. However, there are some slight differences between the movie and the show, particularly with its voice cast. The movie was able to get Christopher Lee and Samuel Jackson to prize the roles as Count Dooku and Mace Windu, but for the actual show, their voice actors were replaced, obviously to reduce costs of having big celebrities and probably because they weren't all committed to doing years of voice work for a kid's TV show. Some actors from the live action movies do reprise their roles though. For instance, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO and Daniel Logan as a young Boba Fett. We even got my man Ahmed Best returning as Jaja. Give me the Boomba. But Mr. Muhammad the Boomba. Yo, Ahmed Best. Com. We are here with the man, the new Anakin Skywalker, Mr. Hayden Christensen. You always wanted to be in Star Wars? Ever since I was a baby. Ever since he was a little kid. He's the new heartthrob. This is Anakin Skywalker. We're going to only give you that much because he got to go back to work. You can't have no more of that. Fun fact, did you know Anthony Daniels' favorite Star Wars character is Shoelaces, Baratheon, Crumb? Yep. When the show eventually did come out, even with my gripes, I watched it a lot. I mean, hey, it was better than anything else that Cartoon Network was playing at the time. Like, I always love the episode where Kit Fisto and his apprentice get stuck inside General Grievous' lair. Not only do we get some much-needed characterization for Kit Fisto, but we do get a glimpse at what it's like to be General Grievous, and we get a little peek at his origins. Or the episode Rookies, where we follow a random group of inexperienced clones stationed at a remote base on a desolate planet, where we just see them work their boring jobs and goof off until they finally get introduced to some action. We actually get to follow some of these clones throughout the entire series, and it has some pretty damn good payoff. 
Now eventually, it didn't happen overnight, but I stopped keeping up with the show. It wasn't that I hated Star Wars or that I consciously one day made a decision to stop watching it, rather it's simply something that sort of happened organically over time as I was getting older. It might have very well been between some hiatus within the seasons, but when you're younger your interests can change so quickly and so drastically in such a short span of time that what you end up with in retrospect is this collection of phases, usually with no defined beginning or end. One second I was into Star Wars and seemingly the next I wasn't. It's sort of like that idea that one day your parents put you down and didn't pick you back up again. It's a bittersweet reminder of how much can change over time without us realizing it. Eventually I did get back into the show and I really started to appreciate it. It took every idea we only got bits and pieces of in the prequel movies and fleshed them out and explored them way further, as well as tied up a lot of misconceptions and gaps in logic. It made the relationships between these characters more believable and entertaining to watch. We actually get a version of Anakin Skywalker that's witty, confident, and caring, and leads with a heart of gold. You know, kind of like how he was described by Obi-Wan in the first Star Wars movie? Anakin and Obi-Wan are just so much more believable as friends in the TV show. We get to explore the hypocrisy of the Jedi Council engaging in a war. We get conspiracy plots, assassination plots. We see how everyday people and planets get affected by this galactic scale conflict. We get to see Anakin become much more disillusioned with the Jedi and the Republic, and nearly every problem with the prequel movies gets addressed and countered, with among some of the best Star Wars stories told, period. Again, we get elements of some of these things in the movies, but never to the degree that the show explores them, nor with the same skilled execution. Sometimes the show even went too far in its characterizations and had to backtrack just to justify what would eventually happen in the movies. For example, the Clone Wars show gave the individual clones personalities and gave us insight into how while that they may look alike, they really are at the end of the day unique characters. There's not much to look at here, sir. We all share the same face. Deceive you, eyes care. In the Force, very different each one of you are. We're just clones, sir. We're meant to be expendable. Not to me. We got to see how they operate, we got to see some of them grow discontent, we got to see some lay down their lives, and we got to see that the majority of them had a mutual respect for the Jedi. Over the course of the show, this got so developed that it made it less plausible that they would all so quickly turn against their comrades in Revenge of the Sith. So the explanation was made that they had microscopic implants from birth that made them betray the Jedi in Order 66. While it sounds like a cop-out, the way it's conveyed is done very well in the show. There's also a lot of moments that are especially shocking for a kid's TV show that aired on Cartoon Network. Even watching it now, I get pretty surprised by what they were able to get away with. And I find it pretty ironic that this cartoon depiction of these stories have more weight behind their violence than the actual live-action movies, which a lot of the times did feel like mindless cartoon violence. It seems like there's no end to what this series was able to accomplish. There's one episode where Jar Jar Binks and Mace Windu go on an intergalactic buddy cop adventure. And guess what? By some miracle of midi-chlorian afterbirth, it fucking works. And for the first time ever, these characters are handled and written well. I'm talking Mace Windu and Jar Jar, one of the most underutilized characters teaming up with what is considered to be one of the most annoying characters in all of cinema, as well as the CGI crux of everything wrong with the prequel trilogy, forming a duo that's actually entertaining to watch and characterized with a sense of humanity. Or rather, Gunganity. We shall make a bombad team, Master and Mace. Indeed. Seriously, somebody get this writing staff on World Hunger. They were able to fix Jar Jar, one of the worst characters of all time. What can't they do? I'm just kidding. I'm so sorry. I'm at best. I love you. Hashtag I'm at best .com. Hashtag Jar Jar did nothing wrong. Peace. Two fingers and we out. Hayden Christensen. <laughs> Booyah. But perhaps the most shocking development from the Clone Wars was just how cherished and beloved the character of Ahsoka would end up being. I've never seen a fanbase's perception of a character go from extremely negative to so positive so quick. It's honestly surreal how far this character has come. For what I used to consider a shoehorned, irrelevant character meant to pander to kids, she became pretty nuanced and enjoyable as the series progressed. You ever play that game with your friends where you all decide which Star Wars characters you be? Have you ever played that game with a group of girls? The pickings for them were always slim. How many good female Star Wars characters are there? Or scratch that, how many female characters in general are there? Discounting the characters Disney would eventually add to the mix, you got Leia, of course. You know, for if you're like the spunky, sarcastic type. You got Padme for if you like being choked. But other than that, maybe the robot diner lady? Thank God Star Wars finally has not just another great character, but a great female character. And it's pretty astonishing how far Ahsoka has come, and she's often considered by some fans to be their favorite. And she has yet to appear or be mentioned in any of the movies. Which brings me to another thing. 
It would be so amazing to finally see these characters in live action again, but done well. Bring back Hayden Christensen, bring back Ian e. McGregor, bring back Samuel Jackson, bring back everybody, and let's finally see these characters done well in live action on the big screen. All of these actors have been proven to give good performances from time to time, so it'd be nice to finally see them work with an actually well-written story. And well-written characters, it doesn't need to be something big, it could be like some sort of secret Clone Wars mission or just something. It'd be such a waste of potential to not see this era on the big screen again. And a lot of these actors are still looking great, they can definitely pass off the same age they did over 10 years ago. Obviously time is of the essence, but please Disney, please, I know you could fit it in there somewhere. Speaking of Disney, after their purchase of Lucasfilm in 2012, production on The Clone Wars was officially cancelled, and according to series showrunner Dave Filoni, nearly three seasons of content went unreleased. A lot of these episodes have been Frankenstein together with animation reels where all the dialogue for the episode was already recorded, and some episodes were simply repurposed into different mediums like novels and comic books. It'll be interesting to see which episodes they go for in this new season. Some of the characters and plot lines from the Clone Wars go on to be included in Star Wars Rebels, also created by Dave Filoni. One character from the Clone Wars Saw Gerrera even went on to be included as a major character in Rogue One, and I think that's really cool. With that and the revival, it shows that Disney recognizes just how valuable the Clone Wars is to the big picture. Heck, it was the only thing besides the films that stayed canon after Disney decided to wipe the old one. While I enjoyed Rebels for what it was, it never did reach the heights of the Clone Wars for me. And as for Disney's new show, Star Wars Resistance, a lot of the response has been negative just from the trailer alone, but we'll have to wait and see. Who knows, maybe it'll prove to be good. If there's anything that the Clone Wars movie tell me, it's that you don't always need the strongest start. Some things just take time to develop when given the proper care and attention. It's why I'm still trying to pass the 6th grade, so quit giving me shit, show me your tits, Freddie Benson, I don't give a shit for your mom from the B-movie. Wait a minute. Galaxy Wars? Well, looks like this shit was meant to be. Do we take prisoners? I don't. Show me your breasts, Nathan Cress, expose me your chest, check the web, where'd your, where'd your net? McCurdy probably getting dirty, getting dick, don't worry about Miranda, spent the remainder of the money, I'll probably hold her down for ransom, I'm a dickhead. That's Coyote Monday fashion, I'm what would happen if Bubsy the cat was fucking rapping, don't you mind me, you getting slime, see? That's the Nick fashion, I'm dick grabbing, I'll wreak havoc as the beat smashes with a B-movie, magic pure as ever, bougie ass is coochie addict me, getting charged with battery, I just want you to love me, Freddy, please. Freddy, please. Th 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 thanks, Junko.